Today, I'm going to discuss six ways you can make your traps better in Dungeons & Dragons. Hey, Lucard here. Today, we're talking traps. And just in case you're new to my channel, I create weekly D&D videos with information and resources to help dungeon masters run awesome games. Okay, here's the thing. Trap making is an intensely creative process. And what I mean by that is I can give you specific steps to how to design a trap, like you wanna think about a trigger, countermeasures, what the effects of the trap are going to be, how much damage it's going to do, what the saving throws are going to be, how they can find the trap, how they can disable the trap. There are a whole bunch of steps that go into that. However, the particulars of deciding what those things are going to be, how the trap is triggered, what type of damage it does, and all of those kind of specifics, there aren't any real steps I can give you because that's up to your own imagination. However, what I can do is give you some general guidelines to work with when you are designing traps. And that's what this video is about. All right, guideline number one is to challenge players not their PCs. And the difference there is that when you challenge players with your traps, you're challenging their ability to use their own brains to think of ways to find the trap, disable the trap, or bypass the trap. When you're challenging their PCs, you're really just challenging their dice rolls and their ability scores. For instance, you might request a perception check or an investigation check, or you might have them do a thieves tools check to see if they can disable the trap. Now, I think at one point in the D&D community, and this might've been a while ago, this was kind of a source of debate among different people, whether a trap or almost any game element should challenge the characters or challenge their players. And for me personally, I think that traps that only challenge their ability to roll dice and add up numbers on top of those dice is rather boring. I think that it's much more interesting, engaging, and dynamic for your players if you place traps in the game that don't just challenge their characters, but challenge your players' resourcefulness, your players' intellect, your players' brains, their own creativity. And I think those sorts of traps are gonna be much, much more interesting, much more fun for everybody at the table. So overall, you want to use traps that challenge your players' resourcefulness and cleverness. Now, you do, of course, want to use dice rules, perception checks, investigation checks, disabled or disabled device. That's, that's a 3.5 edition rule. Uh, thieves tools checks. You do want to do those. You want to use those for sure because it's part of the game and you know if people invest in those abilities and then you never use them, that's kind of lame too. However, what you don't want to do is let the dice and the rolls and the results totally negate and rule out clever role playing and resourcefulness and creativity on the part of your players. So you don't you don't want to go full pendulum and only rely on dice rolls, but neither really do you want to go the other way entirely and disregard all dice rolls. There needs to be a happy balance somewhere. And I think that probably each group might have its own happy balance, and that's probably up to the DM to determine what that balance is. And I believe that somewhere in the Dungeon Master Guide it actually says, do not let dice rolls overcome common sense and clever role playing. I I believe that's like a quote from somewhere in there. So when you're designing traps that require the players to interact with the game environment and the trap to get past it, overcome it, or disable it, what you want to do is you want to make there be things that they can actually interact with. It can't just be this like nebulous trap that they don't know where to start on it. You need to describe something like a pressure plate or a trap box or some sort of mechanism, something that they can fiddle around with, get their hands dirty, and think of things that they could do to somehow bypass, disable, or whatnot this trap. And the trick here is that you, by doing this, you are creating traps that anybody in the party has a chance to interact with and overcome. Not just the rogue, not just the person who has invested heavily in investigation and thieves tools checks. Although there certainly is a place for that because if you totally downplay an investment in those skills, then you're gonna be making your thief upset as well. Well, actually, I think in Fiddition, we now call them rogues because thief apparently has a negative connotations. And one trick for making this work for almost any trap is to require your players to describe what their characters are actually doing. Arr! I want to get past the trap. Okay. How? Arr! With an athletics check. Uh, I'm, I'm good at those. No. Explain to me how your character gets past the trap. Ah, uh, okay, okay, so I, uh, I get a grappling hook, and then I, I tie it to a rope, and then I swing the rope. Uh, the grappling hook, like, 
grabs that brace going along the ceiling. And then I'm going to swing across that rope and I'm going to go right over that pit of bubbling acid and land on the other side. Arr, I am. Arr. And there you go. My horrible pirate accent notwithstanding. Arr. You just made that entire scene so much more interesting and fun, and you encouraged good role-playing. All right, number two tip for making traps better, awesome, whatever, is to slow the trap down. Now, I got this idea, this tip, this thought from my friend Joe. Now, he, every time we talk about traps, he's like, just slow the trap down, just slow the trap down, slow the trap down. What the heck does slow the trap down mean? It basically means that instead of having a trap go off instantaneously and boom, dexterity save or whatever, and then you take damage or whatnot, what you do is you use the trap you basically run a combat with a trap. You roll initiative. And certain parts of the trap take place on different turns in the initiative order. So you're basically slowing the trap down. All your players roll initiative. The trap has initiative. And different things happen in each round. And you're giving your players a chance to do something in reaction to what's happening with the trap. All right, guys. You're going forward through the hallway. And you, Rogue, you're looking around. And then you step one step forward, and a pressure plate goes down just a little bit beneath your feet. What do you do? Ah, uh, I, I, I panic! I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I, I stop, drop, and roll! Hey, you moron! You're not on fire! It was a pressure plate! Something bad's gonna happen! I'm just, I'm just here to smash things. I don't know what to do when... When pressure plates are doing things. All right, guys, as you stand there, kind of not knowing what to do as that pressure plate goes down, both doors at the end of the hallway and then the end you just came in come crashing down. Now what do you do? Ah, oh, crap! How, how am I supposed to know? Ah, uh, I get my thieves' tools out and I, uh, I open the doors. I, uh, take my axe and I start attacking the wall. Oh, you big hairy oaf! You're supposed to attack the darkness! Everybody knows you attack the darkness! Well, no, this is bullcrap because nobody told me about this. I don't even see any darkness around here. Okay, so as you both kind of just stand there screwing around, you hear some noise above you, and looking up you can see these little whirly blades begin to lower towards you. There are like hundreds of them. Sharp blades whirling around. As they come down towards you. What do you do? Ah, oh, son of a gun! I, I start... I start looking around for a mechanism on the walls somewhere, somewhere, something possibly that's that's causing them to whirl and lower. There's gotta be, there's gotta be a way to disable them. Whirly blades, like jigamalagers. Well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take my axe and I'm gonna start smashing the things because I can break them before they get down and start whirling on our heads. Because. Whirling on our heads is probably bad. I mean, I'm pretty sure that'd be bad. Okay, yeah, so Rogue, you definitely find some sort of mechanism behind the walls. You can hear some gears kind of turning back there. And as you look around, you do believe you find a sort of hat so that might give you access to them. And you, big dad, dumb barbarian, um, you start smashing these things and you definitely break a couple of them. However, there are lots of them and you haven't quite cleared enough of a space to be protected from them as they lower. Okay, okay, yeah, a hat! All right, so I, I open the hatch. I get at it with my thieves' tools and all that kind of stuff. Open that bad boy up, and then I, when I see these gears and things kind of whirling around, I want to see if I can study them and figure out a way to jam it. And then I want to use my thieves' tools or maybe a crowbar or something, and then jam that mechanism real good to, like, kind of make it seize up and stop. Uh, yeah, so he's getting a little too excited over there. He needs to, like, calm down a little bit. Uh, while he's probably not calming down... I'm just going to keep on smashing these things and break them up all nice and good-like. Yeah, because the whirling on the head would be bad, I think. Okay, yeah, so Rogue, you definitely find a way to jam that mechanism using your expertise and your intelligence and all of your years of experience in jamming mechanisms. And Barbarian, absolutely, you keep smashing these things. You destroy enough of them that you definitely have a clear area for you. As they lower, you're going to be safe for them. And then through your combined efforts, you manage to get these little whirly giggers to stop lowering towards you. Oh, heck yeah, giddy up! Oh yeah, that's like a big relief because I didn't, I didn't want to get whirly gigged in the head. 
Whirling like gigging in the head is bad. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's bad. That sort of encounter with a trap and having your players play out what they're going to do is going to be a bajillion times more interesting than simply, oh crap guys, you set off a trap, roll dexterity saves, you fail, you save, 100 points of acid damage, or I should say, whirly gig damage, and then, well, you saved, so that's only 50 points of damage. The whole thing of playing it out and actually going through it in turns and deciding what you're gonna do and making meaningful decisions that can have an outcome on whether you get nailed by the whirly gigs or not, that's so much more fun, dynamic, and interesting for your players than simply making some dexterity saves and then taking damage or taking half damage. There's, there's nothing terribly interesting about that. All right, guidelines number three for making awesome traps is to integrate some sort of puzzle element to your trap. So this is very similar to the example I just gave of slowing everything down, only except for it just being a trap, you put a puzzle element into it. And they have to try to solve the puzzle as things are going off and bad things are happening, and the situation is slowly becoming more and more dire. Now, I'm not super great at making up puzzles, I'll be totally honest with you. I usually steal ideas or come up with something rather stupid. But a quick tip that I can give you when you're dealing with puzzles is you can definitely, I would definitely recommend having having a set answer for your puzzle, something that you know is the right answer, but also consider allowing your players to come up with the answer. For instance, as your horrible little situation is unveiling itself and bad things are happening to your players, perhaps the first thing they try, the first puzzle solution doesn't work. And then they try another one and it doesn't work and things are getting really bad. Let's say the barbarian loses an arm or two and the wizard has his tongue chopped off. Just horrible, horrible things are happening to your characters, your players' characters, as they're trying to solve this puzzle. And then finally, Finally, when everything looks horribly bleak, the final solution that they come up with, the last solution they come up with, just happens to be the one that works. Well, who the heck chops Barbarian's arms off and cuts out Wizard's tongue? That's like super cruel and unusual. I mean, I would definitely not recommend you do that. Anyway, of course, the whole trick to this trick of having your players supply the solution is you can't let them know that you're doing this, right? You have to make them think that they actually hit upon the actual answer. It is a suspension of disbelief. It, it, it's an illusion. It's all smoke and mirrors, obviously. But it's a very good trick, one that I use on occasion when sometimes I might even just throw a puzzle or something out there that I don't even know what the solution is, and I 100% intend on just allowing one of the player's ideas to work. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing that every single time because you might argue that that's a little lame or something, but I think it works. I think it definitely makes your players feel victorious. It makes them feel like bad man pajamas because they just solved your puzzle. I, I did say that I'm not very good at making puzzles up myself. Usually what I do when I want a puzzle, when I want, when I want, when I want, when I want a puzzle, I go to some place, obviously it starts at Google, but usually I will find like a thread on Reddit or maybe some other online forum like Giants Playground or something like that where people have compiled a bunch or there are like blogs out there as well where people have compiled lots of different puzzles that you kind of just steal from and get ideas from. So if you are not super creative, as I am not super creative, then I definitely recommend going out there, doing a nice little internet search, and finding something that works, and then stealing whatever you can get your hands on. All right, number four little tip guideline thingy to making traps better is to use the environment in a trap. So what you want to do is perhaps create obstacles that need to be overcome. Like, the, the most obvious thing you can think about is a pit trap, obviously, but that's kind of lame and boring and unimaginative. So instead, let's put some bubbling acid in the pit trap and let's make that pit trap not just like five feet or 10 feet. Let's make that pit trap about 30 feet long and wide. And so the players need to figure out a way to get across that. Now they're probably gonna do something like get a grappling hook and some rope, or your wizard's gonna class the fly spell, or your barbarian's gonna have like this flying hulk jump that he can do. Your players are gonna come up with something that they think is so creative and so awesome. So you gotta think one step ahead of that. So instead of just allowing them to like, oh yeah, we're just gonna fly across, la di da, nice pit trap with acid DM, that really sucked and was easy. What you're gonna do is you're gonna have that acid like burst up into the air 
randomly at certain moments, spraying a wide area with acid and make it nasty too. And if they are swinging across on a rope with a grappling hook and all of that jazz, well, that acid can burst up, get on that rope, perhaps melt through the rope and cause them to drop into the pit of acid. I mean, be devious. Really think of ways to use the environment to your advantage in these traps. And maybe there are little tiny islands on that pit of acid, little stepping stones perhaps. Maybe they get the idea to jump across them, do a little leapfroggy type thing. And as they're going across, let's just say that those little tiny stepping stones, they start like popping down into the acid or they come up a little taller. Maybe they like jiggle back and forth and they have to make some sort of dexterity save not to slip off and fall. Perhaps that pit of acid is raising in level and certain stepping stones are going away. Well. The point here is there are lots of different variations, lots of things you can do to use the environment and to take something that's rather uninteresting like a pit and turn it into something that's really nasty and really cool and really gets your players thinking about how they can bypass it, how they can get to where they're going without like being burned to death in a pit of acid. You could also do things like have traps that are intended not to do damage to the players, but just to slow them down and hold them in one place. You might have them go into a room that maybe the doors come down or somehow the, the exit is sealed and then it slowly begins filling with sand. And being filled with sand isn't a big deal at first until it starts to get up to your chest or your neck or your nose and then you're trying to get atop it and then the sand keeps on filling all the way to the ceiling. I mean, have you ever tried to breathe sand? That's not gonna go over so well. Okay, now we got some story time here. I'm gonna tell you about a really cool and probably very nasty trap that I did once in one of my games. So they were in this kind of like, kind of quasi underwater cavern area and one of the persons decided to go ahead and scout ahead that's pretty normal right well she comes into this like chamber she has to swim under the water and she gets to this chamber that has air in it where you can breathe and there's this sort of island as she comes out of the water and there's this chest on the island anybody and she's probably knowing it as well that it's a trap I mean it's pretty obvious right well she opens up the chest and sure enough there is like some barred gates a door that closes blocking off the entrance and then the water slowly begins to rise and she's thinking oh crap this is not good I could drown in here the exit is closed well I'm just gonna go over there and see if I can open the door well then there is a grate there are a couple grates on the floor under submerged under the water and up through those grates piranhas start exiting actually I think in fifth edition they're called quippers quipper swarms or something like that these things start coming out of the grate and then she's being attacked by these things okay so it's no longer just don't drown it's no longer try to open the door it's now holy crap I'm being attacked while the water is rising while the door is closed and what do I do well now there was actually down through those grates you could go down in there and get to some machinery that would like shut off the water level and open the door she never got quite got that far she may or may not have died in that trap and that might have been her very first game session and I might have felt bad about that. Just, just a little bit. I actually just recently made an entire video about using the environment in traps. All right, here we go. We're on to number five and I promise that we're almost done here. I, I have a very good feeling that this is turning into a fairly long video. So I hope, I hope the information is somewhat valuable to you. And if it isn't, I'm sure you've already clicked off. So no big deal. Anyway, number five is to steal ideas and maybe just steal traps from trap laden modules. There are lots of modules out there that have bunches of traps in them. And you can especially check out, I mean, the Tomb of Horrors was remade for fifth edition. And that is in, what is it called? The Tales from the Yawning Portal. I will put a link down in the description for you if you wanna get your hands on that. That is definitely, I mean, it's a classic module, obviously, the Tomb of Horrors, and has lots of different traps in it, lots of really, really nasty traps in it like some instant death traps or traps that totally just screw you. There are some traps in there, for instance, where if you fall into the trap, you are literally teleported back outside of the dungeon and all of your clothes, magic items, and everything are gone. Like, I, I, should, I, should, I should have said something like a spoiler alert, but that is a nasty, nasty module. And somebody, somebody's gonna freak out on me and be like, spoiler alert, Luke, why didn't you give us a spoiler alert? But you know what? Sorry? And obviously that's not the only module that has traps in it. Most modules have their fair share of traps in them that you can steal from. But the point is, is if you're not super great at making up traps or you just don't wanna bother with the effort of it, then absolutely don't rack your brain. Don't 
you know, beat your head against a wall, go out and grab a pre-made module, a pre-made thing of traps, and it is gonna make your life a little, just a little bit easier, I think. All right, number six goes along a very similar line to number five, and that is simply to use trap making resources online or just straight up buy books that have traps in them. Things like Grimtooth's Ultimate Guide to Trap Making. I think that's what it's called. No, it's called Grimtooth's Ultimate Trap Collection. Now, I I've, I have not read the whole thing. This thing is like, I think it's like four or 500 pages long. This PDF is insanely big. I, there is a link down in the description to it if you wanna go check it out. It's not super expensive over on Amazon and it is just full of traps things you can just steal outright, things you can get ideas and inspiration from. I, I highly recommend it. Even, even if you're fairly good at making traps, it, it might be very useful to you. And of course, if you don't have any money to spend, that's perfectly fine because you can just use Google and you can find, if you just type in D&D &D traps, you're gonna find lots of things online that are gonna have even pre-made traps for you that you can just use. And obviously there are some traps in the Dungeon Master Guide. Xanathar's Guide to Everything has some traps in it as well, but you can definitely just use free resources too. Nothing wrong with that either. All right, and now before I jump into our DM bonus tip, a quick word from our sponsor. If you're looking for an online RPG map making tool, I highly recommend that you check out Dungeon Fog. Check this out, I'm currently using it to create maps for an upcoming adventure that I'll be releasing in Drive RPG, and I really like it. I used to use Campaign Cartographer to make maps, and Dungeon Fog is so much easier to use. And of course it's much faster. Now, you can use the free version of Dungeon Fog to kind of get a feel for what it's like before you want to put any money on the table. And if you like it, the paid version has tons of extra features that are continuously being added to. The paid version is only $50 a year, and if you use my promo code, the DM layer, you get 10% off a yearly sub. All right, now let's just hit on this real quick. I wanna give you a quick word about the products that I recommend and my personal integrity. Now, the folks over at Dungeon Fog are obviously sponsoring this message. However, I only recommend products that I actually believe in, that I actually think are worthwhile, that you will actually find valuable. And why is that? Because I'm not a total sleaze bag. But of course, maybe I am, and I'm just lying to you. Anyway, there is a link down below to Dungeon Fog if you want to check that stuff out. All right, and now it's time for the DM bonus tip. I highly recommend, or I, I should say I suggest, that you use traps sparingly in your games. And the reason is that a trap, if it's just kind of implemented in the standard way of implementing traps, it rather kind of feels like a DM gotcha to players. It's kind of like, oh, you stepped in the wrong spot, make a dexterity save or something, and well, you're gonna take damage either way, so hmm, sucka! So I wouldn't do that thing a whole lot. I would take some time to make sure your traps are a little more interesting, dynamic, and engaging for your players. And when you do institute taps, I mean, at the very least, use the click rule that I discussed in another trap video that I made. Because the advantage to using traps sparingly is that when you do use a trap, you can put a little bit of extra effort into it to make it extra cool, extra awesome, extra whatever, and not quite like a DM screw job to your players. Also, the thing that I probably like most about using traps sparingly is that you get your players to lower their guards. They're not expecting traps around every corner. They're not expecting traps on every chest. They lower their guards, they stop searching maybe, and then when you do use a trap, BAM! You get your players and it's, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm evil, but I think that's, that's more fun. Now, if you do want more information about making awesome traps, I have a couple other videos where I discuss things about traps and making them awesome. One of these little cool video thingy links that's gonna pop up here will take you to my traps playlist. And of course, as always, if you have any questions about dungeon mastering, please just give me a shout out in the comments or whatnot, or even better, come join me on my Discord server, link down in the description, because I'm always happy to help folks out. And until next time, let's play D&D.